Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. And we are talking this week about sexual fantasy. That's fun. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't want to talk about sexual fantasy? I mean, having them is fun. Who doesn't want to talk about sexual fantasy? Uh, lots of people in my experience. Who doesn't want to talk about sexual fantasy <laughs> um, in front of a microphone, in front of people we have no idea who will listen to? Yeah, what? Sounds what like could fun. go wrong? No. So something that I've noticed... We just recorded um, three episodes talking about consensual non-monogamy and specifically talking about how consensual non-monogamy works for us. It was really, it was, it was more vulnerable than I thought it was going to be, even though I've talked about it hundreds, if not thousands of times, it still felt really vulnerable to just say Yeah, well, there it is the recorded stuff. and out on the internet for, labeled. And ever, packaged. And labeled and packaged. And, and so while we're being vulnerable. Why not? Yeah. And I feel like there's a connection myself. Yeah. What do you think the connection is? Well, so we talked about ethical non-monogamy, which is a step away from this imagination of there being one person in the world for you that you devote all of your love energy at. Which is interesting because we do both feel a certain soulmate kind of connection For to sure. each other, yep. which, you know, I like don't even believe in the word soulmate, but there you are. Be in trouble. Be in my trouble. Well, but, but you're talking about the, the, the idea that there's one person that you have to count on for to be your other your your partner in yep. everything and, and and that is sort of the monogamous imagination right. right it's the the partner who's your best friend and your lover your co-parent it's all, all of your things. everything and there's nothing wrong with wanting that but there is a lot to pull apart in it because even when you're walking that path and we've both been in um states of monogamy <laughs> over the course yes, of our have. lives and there is nothing wrong with. In that. fact, there's lots of really awesome stuff about it. And it can and and, and like anything, <laughs> the more intentional and aware you are of all the things you're actually doing in there, yeah, the better things can go for you. Yeah. And I feel like so the the monogamous idea of focusing all my like you're describing my financial and social and and love energy at at this one person okay and what about the erotic energy if my mindset is such that all of my erotic energy should be pointed at you then even my own internal sexual fantasies can feel like a violation of that monogamous agreement yeah. and in expanding out beyond devoting all my energy to you allows me to expend erotic energy in other directions. So now sexual fantasies isn't a thing to feel bad about because it violates an agreement. Now it's something I can actually talk to you about. But that's how you came. This is how I, that's what I'm that saying. Out. This is how yeah. I came to it. Because I think a lot of people, when I talk about sexual fantasy with people, plenty of people are like, well, no, my sexual fantasies are mine. They have nothing to do with my partner and I can share them or not share them. And I tend to agree <laughs> that that's true. So what you're describing, though, that was a that was different for me. So when you mm. and I were first together, I just assumed that the that the the natural state of things, the normal state of things was that we would each have um, a pretty elaborate set of sexual fantasies and erotic desires and that those things would be private, but not secret. Mm. And I also felt like it was normal for them to be um, shared incrementally, like that we would develop an ability to share them. Mm -hmm. You did not have the same I, I didn't set have of assumptions. Any of that. And tell me more about privacy versus secrecy. Yeah. So I think I just 
I just started thinking about this. I actually saw, I think, an Instagram post. I will uh, let me see if I can go find it and I will repost this post. Mm -hmm. It was a it was a great post talking about secrecy being, and I'm sorry that I can't quote the person. I'll definitely link it in the show notes. Um, secrecy being different, distinct from private, because privacy is healthy and helpful and really helps relationships. But secrecy has this connotation of being something you're specifically holding back, and it's not just a birthday present, um, something you're specifically holding back, information that would impact and affect the other person, and you're specifically keeping it from them. So okay. where, versus privacy being something that is yours and doesn't impact your partner. And it's not like there's not nuance here. If, for instance, this is how it came up for me right away. This is why I care about privacy versus secrecy. When we were first together, if you were fantasizing and masturbating and and like having your whole, own whole erotic life, and I had a really a lot of desire going on and I wanted to have sex a lot and you were expending that energy on yourself a lot, I would I felt like you were keeping a secret from me. I felt like right. you were withholding from me. Even though you felt like you this is how I I remember it anyways. It felt like you thought you were just being polite and keeping private things private. Like what yeah. was between you and you was fine. And I I agree with that. And yet there it, was this it lacked some nuance. Right. Yeah, there was like this cuz cuz that is true. It's mine. It's my to to keep to myself. And, it has an impact on you and, and it was in, impacting our relationship. And it was impacting our relationship in a way that we had specifically agreed to be working on yeah so it, there there wasn't anything implicit about it it was explicit it's like hey let's let's build up our sexual relationship and and you know and we were trying to build it up through sharing fantasies through sharing fa and, and yeah. by um and by um engaging in in mutual masturbation i mean that's a whole topic that yeah some people never get anywhere near yeah this I thought it was very typical until I started studying and talking to lots of lots and lots of people. Now, you know the just the the concept of masturbation and where it sits in our our own sexual lives. Like where where do we put that once we're in a committed long term relationship, especially if we're living with someone? Um, where do we put all of our all of our practices, all the stuff we do with ourselves. Especially do we when, share that? All? Especially in a pandemic when there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> nowhere to go, right? Yeah, and you don't have a locked office. Or no, anything. I don't have a locked office. No. I don't even have an office. You don't. I do. I do. So you know, draw your conclusions from there. Um, it doesn't have a lock, but the children know not to come into my office. It already mm -hmm. contains all the scary books. So, um, I I'm but glad yeah. you asked about the difference. It for me, it's a. I feel the difference myself. I can feel it inside mm -hmm. when I am holding something that's private versus when I'm keeping a secret. And I will say that I I have a much better sense of it now, but I still don't have the kind of intuitive sense that you do all the time. And I feel like that comes down to nuance. Like, um, so this is this is mine to be private. Cool not thinking past it to okay how does it affect the people around me because this isn't just about you or sexual fantasies this is yeah, everything it is bigger um and the idea of oh okay so if i keep this to myself what impact does it have on the people around me in terms of the things that i've agreed or committed to do so if you think of yourself them. as a as a part of a collective yes if you remember that that you know communal care and and being part of a community a family, whatever matters, then it, it changes how you, yeah. how you consider these things. Yeah. I think that our, how we were raised and, you know, how privacy and secrecy were handled in our childhood home certainly has to do with this. And then very whatever definitely. we practice in our, in our first uh, marriages, we practiced very different styles of communication around sexual yeah. fantasy, around secrecy. But before we go forward with that, I'd like to circle back to, oh, I'm a circle back girl now. I said circle back. Oh, well, it's happened. You I'm want to spiral back? back? Oh, let's spiral back. Okay. Um, spiral back let's around. spiral back around <laughs> to why, why we would even care about this. Like why? Okay. If I'm going to have a, let's go back to sexual fantasy. Right. Each other's sexual fantasy. Right. Or sharing our sexual right. fantasies. Mm -hmm. So 
sexual fantasy brings into the metaphorical room the same concept that we've been talking about the last three episodes when we were talking about yeah. monogamy versus non-monogamy. It brings the other, capital O, other, yeah. into the equation, right? So I study jealousy, and one of the things that comes up all the time is, well, describe what exactly, define jealousy. So jealousy is the, it's the sense, the fear, the, uh, I'm sorry, the emotion, the complex emotion we experience when we experience a real or imagined, or imagined yeah. interruption to our love bond, right? So real or imagined. So <laughs> if we're particularly sensitive to this, this idea, this, this glop of feelings that jealousy is, the anger and sadness and grief and fear and sorrow and upset and arousal excitement. and yeah. excitement yep. that jealousy can be. If we're sensitive to that, and most people are, um, jealousy is incredibly normal. Um, it's part of the human experience. You don't need to feel bad about it. But if you're sensitive to it, then sexual fantasy can feel like it introduces this this jealous tinge, right? This this potential interruption of the love bond, and it doesn't have to be real. So when I'm talking about this, usually I'm talking about you might imagine that someone has a crush on your spouse, but they don't. But now we're talking about what about what your spouse is imagining? Is that a potential interruption? Right. Yeah. Right. It certainly introduces the primary feature of jealousy, which is the triangle. Mm -hmm. Jealousies are about triangles, right? And a triangle is dynamic and it has lots of energy and that's exciting. Um, and in fact, we can leverage that excitement that jealousy brings yep. um, by, by playing with fantasy, by playing with sharing fantasy, but also by playing with having fantasies. So how do we do that? And introduce the capital O other, like the other, the, the one who is not me, without terrifying ourselves. And so I hear that um, inviting jealousy in any any more neutral way to say, okay, so there will there will be jealousy then. Let's see what happens versus, oh, there will be jealousy, so let's not do that. Yeah. And the way we have approached this, you and I, is to say, okay, well, let's, well, let's bring it up and see what happens, and I think of and it work as it. titrated doses, little bits of yeah. jealousy to find out. So, something that was really interesting in in my study is about a third of the participants experienced arousal with jealousy, as well as the other feelings, anger and fear and sadness and rage and all of that. Um, that arousal, I mean. A lot of people come to me asking, you know, how do they, how do they, uh, people ask me straight out, how do I fix my desire? How do I, how do I want more? How do I feel desire more? And there's, we could go into that. You know, if you haven't read Emily Nagoski's work, mm -hmm. head right to come as you are, especially if you're a cis het, um, couple, but just imagining the other for some of us <laughs> is, is an erotic idea. Yeah. And that, yeah, it, it can spark something where nothing was existing before. So I think that this is a fascinating topic and I, I know that it can be scary to people. Yeah. So we have played with jealousy for our whole relationship, played with it as in like experimented with it. But sometimes I want to put it away. I mean, even though I find jealousy to be incredibly intriguing, sometimes I want to put it away. Sometimes I don't want to have to feel all the stuff that comes with it. What do you do with like the the complication that that is? Like, even though a fantasy is a fantasy and it exists in a non physical realm, what if a fantasy is about? like a real person that we know, or what mm -hmm. if fantasy is about a real situation that you could imagine happening? You know, it's one thing to have fantasies of, of mermaids. It's another thing altogether to have fantasies of somebody who lives in your neighborhood. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's it, or at um, least it feels different when you're describing it to a partner. Or it just does. Me. Well, uh, so if, if I came to you, and said so so here's this fantasy i have had and and my fantasies are more often in the sort of abstract with 
um, with wholly imaginary people. And I describe my, my fantasy. You get one experience. And if I insert a person that we both know, yeah, that would completely change completely the experience. Completely different experience. Right. And even now, a famous person. That's right. Yeah. Oh, right. even yeah, that we know uh, of. Not right. even someone that we either one of us Where has a relationship put, like, a, with. A real yeah. So this but really someone is, who literally walks the earth yeah, and you versus know them. Utterly could, um whatever. derived from the imaginal realm. <laughs> yeah. It really does have a different texture and tone. It 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 hits differently. Even as you're talking about it, I'm like, yeah, it that as and the girls would say, that slap's different. That slap's different. I cannot different. speak teenage. No. I can't do it. We've heard a lot of it, though. <laughs> um, and so there's there's your experience of, of... So I share my fantasy, and you have an emotional experience hearing it. And you enter it into your imagination. And then it goes... And then, I mean, I lose track of it. At that point, it does what you do with it. Right. And my fantasy is my own. There are now two different ones, yours right. and mine. But the thing is... And then there's she, the co-created ones. And then there's the ones that we co-create together. Sure. And in the process of me sharing my fantasy with you, we both learn something about what I find erotic Yes. What fascinating, and not just erotic, but what features of the world attract my attention? Like yes. there's so much to learn about me as an individual, both for me and you. Yeah. And then you take yours, you take my fantasy, turn it into something, and now you learn something about yourself. And then together we can bring a fantasy out. And now we learn about each other. It's freaking amazing. It is. So oh. both of us experience this as an essential feature of our relationship. Yeah. Um, and I've had lots of relationships where this wasn't the case. Yep, me too. Um, where sex just didn't really include a lot of words. Um, or if it did, it was sort of the same the same set of words or the same fantasy that would get played out over and over again for years. And um, for whatever reason, that just doesn't really work for me. I, I don't... Um, I, I didn't... I thought I didn't like... A bunch of things about sex because of that it turns out most of my erotic energy is in my imagination it's it, it's in my it's in my mind and it's in the actual words like speaking the mm -hmm. words saying them out loud you are a mu much more so i'm an entj you're an isfp we could not be more different in personality types but that that s you're much more sensate focused I am. And yet you have a rich imagination. Well, but how do you experience this differently? Visual. Like, so one of the reasons that I have trouble turning my fantasies into words, uh, trouble. Um, it is clearly more challenging for me to verbalize my fantasies than it is for you to verbalize yours. That's true. Right. Well, that's, that's that has been our experience. And one of my challenges is to convert the visual thing. It's like trying to describe a movie. Like to someone who's and sitting on the other side of the screen like, and can't yeah. see it and trying to describe it in real time as the things are happening fast enough to keep the story going and to get the sense of it across. Well, so, right. so the words. And so um, I don't. Third so person. sometimes I just give up. That's fascinating. <laughs> and, I though, and I've noticed this. You, <clears throat> you do sometimes sort of third person your fantasies. I always first person my fantasies. Yeah. Well, it's all, I'm always in them. When. When Which is also I, how I dream, but I've well, interviewed a lot say. of people about dreams and lots of people dream as if they're watching their dreams. It wasn't until I started working with Dr. Green yeah. that I my dreams started to shift to first person. Right. I was relieved. I didn't even know that that was a thing for much of my adult life and because I have dreamed first person for a very, very, very long time, really as long as I can remember. Yeah, I've tried to avoid responsibility most of my life, so I didn't <laughs> even take responsibility for my dreams. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that might be a little bit real. You know, it's funny for a guy with so much responsibility, you don't take a lot of responsibility. Is that a real sentence? I don't think Somehow, that's true. I think you is. have avoided it, but also embraced it. It's. I think you hold a lot of tension around that. But specifically around sex, you have struggled. Oh, I really with have. This well, I time. have. This has been challenging so you... since day one. This has been challenging because some of the things that I have thought they're just fine. We just talk about all of it. Mm -hmm. 
some of these things took you years to be right. able to even find words for. One of the first things we did was just um, just try to establish the most basic shared dialogue and just trying to figure out which words you could say out loud. I used the words that Sheldon uses. Yes. Coitus. Yes. <laughs> yes. And and I um I actually used, never used that one. Not but. that one, but that might be the only one you don't use. That one sounded too dirty. I, I didn't oh, use boy. it. Yeah. <laughs> so first finding our shared language, yeah, which took years. And in amongst that, finding the shared language, we were able to deepen the sharing of fantasy. Because before we had shared language, there would be there would be stories that I would be building up, but I didn't know how to I didn't really know how to say them without saying the words, but the words seemed to make you uncomfortable. You, well, you seemed really so uncomfortable. You mentioned earlier that our two separate upbringings. You know, yeah, it was very, very different. different. I was raised in a house where there was porn under you know my parents' bed and whatever. And it, it was very casual. And it was talked about. And, and it was it, talked about. Yeah, it was just whatever. And in my house, it just wasn't. There wasn't active back pressure against it. But no one ever talked about sex to me in my family. Yeah. And um, the result was that I internalized, and uh, I don't know, maybe there's other ways to respond to this, but I internalized it as, oh, well, those must be shameful things. Not in thoughts, but in, in my imagination of what should be. I shouldn't talk about this. Why? Because no one did. So that there's a pattern that must mean something. So I won't talk about it. So when I got to you at 43 years old, at 43 years old, I did not have any language for it. Yeah. And I avoided the language that was there. I, you use like, Oh, I'm so proper. And, and I was yep, proper. I thought you were so I mean, proper. I mean, I, it was on my bucket list to, uh, yeah, to, to get your mind in the gutter. gutter. I was like, come on. And the thing is my mind was in the gutter, but what wasn't was my language. Yeah. And which just made it all more challenging and made interesting, more to challenging me. to share my fantasies and to, yeah. So, so for me, some of the blocks were shame. Hey, we're talking about sexual fantasies and shame came up. How interesting. Shocking. Shocking. Right? Um, so that was so how my have you experience. moved away from shame because you do share your fantasies with me now. We, I know that there are some things I do, like one of the things I do is set a container for them, I make sure that I, I've invited you to share a fantasy um i'll dim the lights and i'll make sure that like you you've actually been verbally and physically invited to yeah. share that and it takes I try a to lot offer of you. it does but then i also try to offer re encouragement by mirroring your language back to you i'll shift my language a little bit to to mirror what you're saying so that you can hear that i'm hearing you and i watch my facial expressions so those are the things i do but what do you do? Because it's hard. Your example of being so comfortable talking about it has helped a lot. Um, so it helps my imagination of what's possible. I don't have to just fight through the the silence of, you know, that, that I was brought up with. I have your example. And you have introduced me to a world of other people who are comfortable yeah. talking about this. Um, <laughs> this. <laughs> <laughs> Still. Oh <laughs> so my. There's all these, it's it's right there. So um by by connecting me with sex educators and people interested in um in sex as a topic, I have come and easier people who to treat talk. sex as a hobby. <laughs> and who treat it's, sex as a hobby? Um you or know, a profession? There's right. The, like there are these pe people who take sex very seriously and therefore have a lot of fun with it. Right. Right. And that's it the did thing. change. So, <clears throat> a lot of things changed for us when we went to Asar. Yes, it did. So we oh, my went, um, we had been working on this for years. And then I decided to get my certificate in sexuality studies. And that was a whole thing. And I needed to start off by going to Asar. That's a, a an SAR, a sexual attitude reassessment. Um, it's a great concept. It's a, it's a, two or three day process by which you're exposed to different sexual ideas, um, acts, behaviors, patterns, and given time to process and reflect on how they feel for you. And because I was going and I wanted to go to one that happened to be far away, you came with me and we both went and that, and we were in different small groups. So we processed separately yeah. and um, you got to process with the 
the infamous um, Captain Snowden. Yes. And um, and I got to process with awesome. Dr. DeShavo. And it was great. It was it feels like little baby versions of us now. I go back and I think, oh, we were so oh, cute. But And without <laughs> that, for me, without it, um, it, it really jump-started my ability to look at myself and to discover the shame because it didn't feel like shame. It just felt like right and wrong. Right. Okay, wait, um, say that again. Yeah, so it... it it hadn't felt like sex was shameful. It didn't feel like I was doing shameful things. It felt like these were things that were objectively right and wrong. So much deeper than shame. So much deeper like, than shame. Now you're into taboo mm -hmm. and violation. Yep. And so in your mind, and this was my experience of you, it was as if every time you touched yourself or you touched me or you touched someone else, I could see you feeling like you were doing something wrong. Yeah. And that was really hard because then it would be difficult to figure out how to, how do I convince you that in fact, this is entirely consensual. Like right. we're, uh, it was, I and, mean, introducing <laughs> words also introduces the concept of consent because it's really hard to get consent if you don't <laughs> have any words. words. Yeah, that is absolutely true. So while I was worrying about right and wrong, I yep. was doing things that were objectively wrong. That's, by that's not so seeking real. But yeah, I mean, yeah. we didn't know. We didn't have, we're old. We didn't have the language that we have now. And I certainly we've both done things wrong because of it. So there were, you asked, oh, for sure. Without, and the language, as, as our language develops, our concepts develop, and we are able to relate better. Yeah. Uh, more. With more um, respect and autonomy. Yeah. Um, there were two other things that I wanted to say. You asked how I got there. And one was uh, your example. The second was believing you, which wasn't mm. easy. Because even, I mean, from your point of view, you were like, what? I invite all the time. <laughs> it's like, well, yes, but that's what someone would be would do if they were trying to trap me into doing something <laughs> wrong, too. Uh, it's just ridiculous, yes. but you know, the, it's the things that happen in our heads. Yeah. And yeah. And they're not, it's not a conscious line of thought. That's no, that, that's that no. bubbling around unconscious, yeah. subconscious level of thought. For my purposes, I think when you decided to believe me, when I said that it would be okay if you made a mistake, <laughs> if you, yeah. if you said something or shared a fantasy that was too edgy for me, which, you know, rise to the challenge. Um, see if you can see if you can frighten me. Um, now if you shared something that was too edgy that I would just say, Hey, I need a timeout mm -hmm. or I would, I would ask you to pause or I would safe word. And that is so key. The have for, a safe word for sharing sexual fantasies. Why yeah. not? We, in fact, I think I have used my safe word for sexual fantasy sharing probably 10 times more yeah. than I have used mm -hmm. it for physical sensation. Yeah. So let me say that again. Put a safe word in your relationship. Yes. Use it for everything. For use everything. It, use it for stopping pointless fights and use it for It acknowledges the sharing. fact that we're going to make mistakes, that I'm going to say things. First of all, it gives me the opportunity to make a mistake and then yeah. fix it. Because if I make a mistake and you just stay with it mm -hmm. and you endure it and suffer it, that's going to grow into something else. Yeah. Until it's dealt with, it's just going to keep developing into something. And the sooner we can bring it out and work with it, stop it, whatever, the the less disruption it'll be to our connection, which yeah. is so key to me. It is. Being able to talk about all of this has been the differentiator for me yeah. between this relationship and all the others I've had. Um, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And it's what I'm looking for when I'm looking for other relationships and even friendships. Mm -hmm. What I'm looking for is the ability to um, talk really freely, establish our norms, yes, but then be able to challenge those norms even in the relationships and and be able to make a mistake and say, yeah. oh, let's just try that again. Yeah. The same way I would with a kid. This is awesome. Yes. <laughs> okay. I think this it's is a good place to stop. Yep. So let's stop. We'll come back and we'll pick this up. But if anybody wants to share thoughts about this, I would love to hear them. You can email me at jolie at joliehamilton.com. And yeah, we can talk. See ya. See ya.
Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to jolie at joliehamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the entrepreneur's action plan for passionate, sustainable love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news.